Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the UE St. Augustine Faculty of Law Research Skills Series. This is our second seminar that we're having for semester one of the 2022 to 2023 academic year. And I'm very excited to welcome two excellent speakers to today's session. We will have Dr. Metka Potnik from Wolverhampton University. She is coming to us as a director of the F List, which is an organization which promotes female artists in the UK. So we'll be learning about how her research is able to help with practical change in the industry through her involvement in this organization. We'll also be hearing from Cinna Menz, who is coming to us from ClauseBase, which is a very innovative software that focuses on using AI for contract drafting. So very excited to hear from both of our speakers today. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask throughout. If not, you can put it in the chat and I will be moderating. So I'm going to hand it over to Metka to start off today's proceedings. Thank you, Emma. And uh, I'll invite both of you to ask questions just in case you're the only people here <laughs> so that we will have some kind of an exchange. Almost there, I promise. There we go. So thank you for extending the invitation, Emma. I, I appreciated the opportunity to speak to, well, mostly largely uh, law researchers around different ways maybe of doing research, not just the traditional reading uh, cases and, and then going through interpretation and looking at the different wordings in statutes, treaties and case law. So what I will be looking at today is how my research, which is a feminist approach to intellectual property law, is used in a very practical way, by way of whether strategy or, or by luck, through my work in the F-List. So I will start with outlining the F-List for music, what it is, a little bit about the profile, then just one or two slides around my approach in research, but uh, accepting that this talk is not us uh, speaking substantively about the work we do, rather uh, alternative ways uh, that we approach research. And I will then focus towards the end of my talk on different things we do with the F list that hopefully, if not in the short term, at least medium and long term, will uh, start that practical change in the UK music industries. So if I start with the profile, of the F list for music, what it is. And you see that abbreviation of KIC, that's a community interest, uh, interest company. So it's a nonprofit in the UK. Um, so there have been reports and um, research done, and, and this is not my research. This is research of my fellow colleagues who do research, who are also feminist researchers. They're looking at the UK uh, music sectors, but some of the reports are also more broadly in other jurisdictions that cover discrimination against women and gender expansive uh, people in all aspects of the music industries. So if you look at representations in the record labels, music publishing, you see this huge uh, gender imbalance. So mostly the talent that is signed on, uh, at least in this country, in the UK, is mostly male. Uh, large underrepresentation of uh, headliners in festivals. So women currently, according to a BBC study, are at 13% of headliners. Radio, again, similar story. We have research reports that will speak about um, women not being played as often on radio as men how much um, musicians earn on average. There are different pockets of research and different reports attesting to this. But according to a UK IPO study, on average in the UK, um, musicians have reported £20,000 of earnings a year. And comparatively, women in that same bracket have reported earning only 13000 So there's this £7,000 um, £7, gap. And the same with orchestras, the um, compositions played by orchestras are mainly, uh, have been written by male composers. When we look at senior leadership roles or the gender pay gap, the same story continues. So there is a vast um, um, range of reports where we see that there are intersectional gender hardships experienced by women and gender expensive artists mm -hmm. across the music sector, across the music industries. And the F list really is 
a practical response to this research. So Vic Bain, who is the founder of the SF List, has done the research around record labels and music publishers and the rosters that we have and, and uh, finding those numbers where um, most the talent signed on by record labels, the artists are mostly men. Um, and, and in her... Um, activist work in response to her research she came up with this idea of the f list of coming up with a database that will have all the women artists uh, pulled together in one way where we can easily find them so the f list is a practical response to research um, the uh, research shows that um there are not that many women uh, represented across the music industries. And often we would hear, oh, but there are no women in the sector. Or the other option was, we do not know how to find uh, female talent to book it for different shows. So the F list now, it used to be an Excel spreadsheet. It is now a um, very interactive and easy to use website a database that has a large number of musicians of women who are women and gender expansive artists who are listed in different categories. And you can see you have musicians, you have singers, solo artists and so forth. And we're looking at over 5,500 listings so far. And at the bottom, you also see music researchers, which is where we are uh, based and how we are com coming together as researchers in the F list. So the F list is a database of women and gender expensive artists uh, who are active in the UK. And that database can be used by uh, promoters and uh, booking agents to um, find women when they're trying to book music for their event or if they're trying to place music in different projects. The F list itself is a nonprofit and it has a president. The president is always a public facing role. Uh, so we had Anushka Shankar, we now have Brick Smith and we will have a turnover in November. You then have a list of 12 directors of the F list, currently one place we're trying to fill. And you then have also the F list ambassadors who are promoting and raising awareness around the work we do and some sister organizations and partnerships. Where does the research fee uh, fit into all of this or feed into all of this is that when Vic was thinking about the F list as, as a response to her own research, uh, she was very keen and we've uh, agreed on the board of directors for the, uh, for research to be the bedrock of all of our activism and intervention. So one of the aims of the F list is to increase knowledge by conducting research into gender inequality in music. So our, the F list is um, placed on the foundations of research. So it is that then informs our direction, strategy, plans, and everything we're trying to do. So this was just an introduction to what the F list is. And as promised, I would just mention briefly around the approach I take um, to intellectual property law. Um, so we have seen that musicians do not earn the same amounts of, so women will not be reporting the same amount of earnings when compared to, or when in comparable uh, situations to male musicians. And, and how we earn or the rules that will govern uh, the commercialization or exploitation of music are intellectual property rules. So it is copyright and the exclusive rights that will dictate how we make money. So royalties are linked to copyright. And yet it doesn't seem there's been much investigation into whether or not intellectual property law itself plays a role in, in these differences that we see in the amount of earnings made by women. And as a feminist approach to IP, I found it very helpful to, to, to just borrow Anne Bartos' um, uh, explanation, which really very um, helpfully uh, explains what it is to have this stance, to have this approach or, or a feminist approach, feminist um, um, lens, if you will, to intellectual property law. And she has stated that the most important feminist methodological tool is careful observation. 
And that means we are curious about the world around us and we identify and record differences between men and women, if there are any. And if there are, you then follow through to say, you ask what causes these differences and whether one gender is at, at a disadvantage. And you will remember from the start that whichever aspect you look at, whether it's radio, whether it's streaming, whether it's orchestras, whether it's earnings, whether it's record label rosters, we see that there is this gender in um, imbalance and even more so intersectionally, the situation gets much worse. So it is then that final step, we try to figure out what role the law has in creating, maintaining or minimizing observed gender hardships. And it's this last part that I'm really, really using in my research. That is what my research is about, trying to figure out whether copyright, if not in the first part, if copyright is not to, to sort of responsible for creating these gendered, intersectionally gendered um, hardships, is it perhaps responsible for maintaining some of these hardships, specifically the power imbalances we see in the system? And the feminist uh, lens or approach is then, of course, also coupled with the method. Um, so as you have as many feminist theories available as, as you can sort of um, go through different readings. So there's plenty of different feminist theories and myself, I'm going for relation of legal feminism, but very helpfully as a feminist scholar, you also have methodological um, approaches that you want to consider. And they are, um, so the intersectionality in, in my case is also used as a method, not only as a theory. Um, there are also tools around raising awareness and consciousness, practical reasoning, and importantly, this practical approach is embedded in the lived experience of women. And it is this cross-section of feminist method and me placing myself in the F list, in the uh, musical context in the community of women and gender expansive artists that really makes a difference. And as a researcher, I then have this opportunity to, to, to make my research findings actually mean something. Um, feminist research is also most effective when it's interdisciplinary. So it is not enough as a feminist scholar in law to work in your own silo or you, in your own pink ghetto. That was some uh, a, a phrase coined by some of the US scholars. It is very important to create these links with other scholars in the field. So that's what I do. I, I combine, I connect with other feminist researchers in the music field, and they will be doing their own um, areas. They, we have scholars who are looking into business fields, organizational studies, sociology, musicology, and so forth. And feminist research is most rewarding and, and can find uh, solutions to really complex problems such as gender pay gaps, such, such as gender discrimination. Um, it is most uh, rewarding um, or the most creative in finding uh, solutions to these very complex problems when it's collaborative. So we are looking at interdisciplinary networks, we're looking at collaborative uh, networks, and when we are working together, that also gives us the tool to resist and push back against imposter syndrome and authority gap. And there is this brilliant book on authority gap uh, written by Marianne Zeekhardt on why women are not seen seen as seriously as men, uh, and there's research around that, so women are just not believed as, uh, as scholars, uh, or at least not equally to men. Um, and of course, as a feminist researcher, I also have other transferable skills that can prove very helpful, and I will show you in research-based activism, and that is my, my final point. Um, so, the research I do as a feminist scholar in IP, I used every time I have anything, any interaction with the F list. And that is on a weekly basis. It, it, it permeates all the work I do because it is um, what here in the UK we call impact. It, it is making uh, a change or attempting to have an effect outside of the academic world. So 
the first one, the obvious one is that I give my time to towards the work the FLIS does. I sit on the board and you see other uh, musicians who sit on the board as well. We meet very regularly and we we plan all the activities and, and campaigns and we set goals towards ensuring professional sustainability of careers for women and gender expansive artists. We also look at uh, ways to reform not only legislative rules or policies, but also the industry itself and, and any kind of actions that might take. Now, of course, this kind of work is based on volunteering. So it is you giving your time as a researcher to, to uh, making a change, a practical change in the industries and mentioning before what are the characteristics of the uh, of a feminist researcher uh, and and highlighting the need to have an intersectional approach so thinking beyond just gender as a barrier to success in the music industries looking also at race ethnicity age is a big one in the music industry class especially here in the UK as well and disabilities Again, one of the characteristics we do need to consider. Um, so intersectional, interdisciplinary and collaborative research meant that, and, and us then, the F-List uh, building or founding all of the activism on research meant that very early on, we, we figured that it would be very helpful if we had a way of bringing researchers together so that we would know uh, of each other's research, we would know when, what are the specialisms of different people who are involved in the F list. And that's why if you look at the F list that I was showing you, we do have listings where you have music researchers and we know what we are doing, what each other are doing. And just today we started the first research hour. So that's a webinar series that we have with researchers um, in the F list, where we will have different researchers speaking about their research and others who are attending also sharing their expertise and projects and perhaps uh, different ideas for future collaborations. So not only do I do work with the F list and sit on the board of directors, I'm also the lead on the F list gender and music research hub where we work closely together with Vic Bain, Sophie De Daniels and some of the others as well. And at, at present, I think we had one, at least one more. So there's 37 researchers and we're hoping. And why is all of this important or as important uh, going forward is that we have seen um, in the UK, we've seen several different legislative inquiries being published and, and then the turnover for, for or, or the time given to submit evidence on a particular issue is very narrow. You would, if you have a month to respond to a call for evidence, that's already very generous uh, to, 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 to have that luxury. So we are quite keen on having all these research pockets of research that we can draw on quite easily and then submit on behalf of the F list and all of its members submit uh, written evidence. So the example here you see, and that's all published online. So if anyone wants to see that, we I can send a link or you can just Google for it. We've submitted, so this year we submitted uh, in July, uh, a submission to misogyny in music inquiry. So that's the um, inquiry with the UK parliament, the Women's Inequalities Committee. And, and a lot of the research that we've done is included in this. And it also covers business aspects. It covers uh, gender discrimination, sexual harassment, bullying aspects. It covers IP aspects and so forth. So if you have this expertise, you can then um, submit meaningful evidence to inquiries because you've already you're thinking ahead and you can prepare uh, ahead to have these submissions easily pulled together and on top of that you also have researchers who have the skill set to do a submission like this it's not something you can easily write up if you've never done before we've had some submissions in the past as well that the UK intellectual property office in uh, not specifically us, but there was a call for evidence. And the other one we submitted to was also the inquiry of the DCMS committee on the economics of music industry, uh, of the streaming in the music industry. So that streaming inquiry was one where we submitted, but that one was very difficult to pull together quite as easily as we did with this one, which was the 
third one that we submitted to. So we had uh, more research to draw on and it was a bit more squarely within the activities of who the EFLIS researchers are and what we do. And just to conclude, um, I would say that part of the work we do with uh, as a researcher um, uh, with the EFLIS is that we go to different conferences and, you know, I've just sort of plastered it all, all across there uh, as different things we do, but we go to our own conferences. So for me, that's a legal conference, but we also then go to each other com each other's conferences. So I've attended the music conference in the same week that we had the SLS conference in London. And, and going across disciplines to speak about these problems is actually aware raising awareness around the a complexity of this discrimination and uh, of this unfair treatment of women and gender expansive artists in the sector. And we can only look at these solutions if we are, again, uh, as feminist researchers, if we're looking at things intersectionally uh, across disciplines and we're looking for solutions in a collaborative way. Um, I think in the interest of time, that brings me to my end and I will uh, conclude or I'm not sure whether we're having questions right now or we're doing it at the end of the second talk. I think maybe that would be better. I, I don't know. Emma, so we'll have, be... we'll have questions for your talk now. Thank you very much for that, Metka. That was very interesting. I do have questions, um, but let me just ask. I saw some people have joined. So does anyone have questions? You can unmute and ask your question. Thanks, Emma. Um, and thanks for a very interesting presentation, uh, Metka. Can everyone hear me properly? Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions. So the first one is, um, at which point in the music industry is the gap between male and female performers uh, the largest? Um, is it at the sort of entry point? Is it mid-career or is it at the high earning level? Um, because I, I think, I don't think it's, it, it is going to be near impossible to dispute that there isn't a pay gap or wage gap between, let's say, uh, male and female uh, perf performers and persons involved in the industry. But um, at the highest level, how you know is what does the data suggest in terms of the gap? Uh, is it in the first place? So let's say the Taylor Swift and the Beyonces, etc. How do they compare to the biggest male owners? Mm -hmm. And then, well, secondly, um, where is the gap the biggest as a cross section? Because I mean, it's undeniable that uh, women make less than men. But uh, at which point in the industry is is the gap the biggest? <laughs> There's so many gaps. So. Um the and this is the type of research that Vic Bain and some of the others are doing is that you speak of a vertical hierarchy structure so if you look at the business um uh, the business roles if you will who's in the senior leadership roles that's across the board so in the record label a structure in the publisher structure even if, if you look at CMOs collective management organizations at the top you have mostly men who are running the show in in terms of the artists themselves, you've mentioned Beyonce, you've mentioned Adele and some of the others, and, or Taylor Swift. Uh, if you look at the rosters of how many artists are signed to, to the record labels, again, it's almost 80% men. Now, we know that the artists who are uh, with the record labels, they don't have it, perhaps it, their situation is not perfect, uh, but they will have more support in getting their music out there than independent artists do. And the reason or what my research has shown just through qualitative data doing interviews is that women have selected to go as independent artists with the aim of preserving their creative control. So in terms of the gender pay gap, I think the largest split you see is um, when you look at bonuses. So then the, the, um, the amount of bonuses that is given to men and women is, cannot be compared. Uh, the gender pay gap itself is I think around 40%. I think that those were the statistics from last year. So it depends on whether you're, whether you're looking at people who are working within the industry or you're looking at the artists. The artists, one of the IPO reports was that um, this, the difference was 7,000 pounds for the average paid artist. So if on average, so that was reported by the UK IPO last year. If the average musician, male musician reported making 20,000 pounds a year um, uh, in that particular year, um, 
an average woman artist reported making 13,000 pounds a year. So a 7,000 pound difference and at those numbers as a third. I've just heard today of a Canadian um, uh, report that Vic was speaking about to us in earlier in the morning. And she said that there's research around when you look at composers in Canada and how they're paid, apparently it's an eighth, eight times. So male composers will be paid eight times the amount that female com composers will be made. So wherever you're grabbing those numbers, there's several reports that I didn't go to today because of the nature of the um, of the talk. But yeah, I think wherever you grab it, you'll find the differences. There's definitely, if you look at statistics on how many men and women study music, that's where you see the most parity. It's almost 50-50. Um, and then even entry level jobs in the music industry, again, you have a lot of women going into the industry. And then the higher up you go the hierarchy, the more it becomes, uh, the balance goes off. Thanks for that. And I have a second question. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we all, I think anyone who studied copyright law, entertainment law, anything like that knows that the music industry doesn't have the best reputation for being fair, equitable, equal even. Um, in terms of the research that you've done and the research that the group is doing, has there been a lot of pushback because you're really challenging the status quo of the music industry? And how does that sort of factor into the research process? Um, it has been, so one of the most obvious um, sort of res consequences is that it's very hard to get the record labels streaming services and some of the other big players cmos so in the uk the prs for music to actually see this or recognize this as a copyright problem so we would often see you know rules are written in the same way for everyone so there's no problem there it, it it's always dressed as you know a, a a problem an artist would have by not knowing the rules rather than there being a systemic problem in how the rules are set up um i mean Anecdotally, so from from all of my colleagues, the pushback has been horrendous in 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 how it's been sort of um, when you are doing this kind of work. It, it, it's been quite um, um, surprising, really, even from for myself to to hear how many times the women researchers were told that the music is just better when it's written by certain people. So the pushback has been big, but. It, you're right to say that also music industry has not been seen as the most fair ones. And, and we've seen that last year with the DCMS inquiry into music streaming, where there was then a proposal to have a the competition, the competition to CMA, the Competition Market Authority in the UK do a competitive review of the record labels. And then they decided it, that it's a non-issue. So there was nothing really done. So there has been pushback. Uh, the consequences themselves are just to focus on the policymakers that do have to, or that, that have less of a vested interest. So for us, things like Women's and Equality uh, Committee to, to make sure that when we're talking about misogyny in music, that we do raise these questions around IP rules as well. So that nothing is assumed to be gender neutral in, in the way the rules and the organizations work. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Metka. As I'm aware of the time, I'm going to hand over to Sina, but I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I remember hearing your presentation, SLS, I'm thinking I hope this person can speak at this um, research skill series, because not only is the actual research important, I think the way in which you do the research is important. I think a lot of us, um, unless we've been specifically tra trained in feminist research, um, we might consider ourselves feminists. I know I do, but I don't necessarily know how to go about this type of research. So it was very enlightening to hear your approach as well as the impact that your research is having. We know there's a lot of buzz about research impact and different journals having different scores assigned to them and all that. And I have many thoughts on that. <laughs> but my thought on this is that you can see that you are having an impact in the industry and um, you will, of course, continue to get pushback. But I think it's very important that the work that you are doing at the FLIF, and I think it's very great to see an academic go beyond the classroom and into society, because I do think that is meant to be a large part of our jobs, actually do something with all this research. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. um, apologies for the Zoom link issue. It will be shared on YouTube, though, so everyone will be benefiting from this. Thank you.
Thank you. And I'm going to hand it over to Sina now so we can hear very much about the use of AI in contract drafting. So Sina, I have done some contract drafting um, and I read your website and the thoughts were basically echoing in my mind where you're afraid if you make a certain errors, but at the same time, you're meant to be following certain rules and you want to get it perfect. But this is no easy task. So I'm very interested to hear about your work. So I'm going to hand it over to you now. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Let me just immediately start by sharing my screen. And then you should be able to see it now. Yep, uh, I hope can that's see it. working. Okay, terrific. So um, what I'd like to talk about uh, today is, is, as the title of the, this presentation suggests, is AI and contract drafting. Typically, these kinds of presentations uh, tend to um, do a lot of kind of like um, um, uh, looking into the future and kind of saying, okay, this is all, these are all of the possibilities and AI is going to change our lives and it's going to be this revolutionary thing. Uh, and I like to be a little bit contrarian on that front, and I'd like to uh, put people uh, put people's feet back on the ground. So what I'd like to do today is to just give you a very sort of real world practical overview with, of course, our own tool clause base as, as sort of a, a, a guiding uh, um, uh, thread, so to speak, a real life practical overview of how the actual practical applications of AI and contract drafting look like, and more specifically, what the limits are currently, but also for the foreseeable future. So uh, let me just maybe start by um, sharing a little bit about where, where I come from. So my name is Sen. I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of ClauseBase. Uh, in a former life, I was a, an attorney at DLA Piper. I worked in their Brussels office where I did a lot of um, intellectual property uh, and IT work, uh, but especially near the, the end of my tenure as a lawyer, um, I was doing a lot of GDPR work. In any case, all of these disciplines do feature a lot of legal drafting. Legal drafting was uh, the majority of what I did uh, uh, in, my, in my former career. Um, and of course, so I, I did experience the typical issues with legal drafting being very repetitive, being very time consuming because it's all very artisanal, even though you're you're typically reusing clauses when, when you're drafting new documents, you're reusing clauses and precedents from, from files and for clients that you've you've worked with in the past. But it's it's the kind of thing where a lot of value can be created. Um, but most of the time spent creating that value is doing a kind of work that you know, isn't isn't really like uh, adding a lot of value. Specifically, uh, I like to refer to, to it as as the battle with Microsoft Word. Um, that was a, especially because um, I, I didn't stay at at, uh, at LA Piper for all that long. I stayed for two years. So being a junior lawyer is basically all all I've I've known. Um, and uh, yeah, being a junior lawyer means you have to do this kind of very time consuming, very repetitive. Um, very detail-oriented work of making sure that uh, all of the um, the punctuation uh, is correct and making sure that all of the terminology refers to the current client and not the previous client, um, which is where you, you got the precedent from, that kind of thing. So what did we build with ClauseBase? Well, basically, um, we uh, with our tool, our clients can take all of their templates, take all of their precedents, and upload them to an intelligent clause library. Um, and from that clause library, a lot of different options are available. Uh, you can see that on the right-hand side of this slide here. Um, I can actually subdivide that in, in two specific workflows as well. Um, so what you'll see is that a lot of in a lot of cases, documents are drafted in high volume, but with low alteration. Uh, where, where volume is the main challenge uh, for getting uh, contracts and, and, and other legal documents out of the door. This is something that we typically see in legal departments. Uh, in, in larger they'll they'll typically have these kinds of self-service platforms for um, the rest of the business where they can say, okay, I need an NDA and I'll just go and browse the, the platform that the legal department has made available for me, the template that this legal department has made available for me. Um, so it's perfectly possible to automate those documents with clause base to, to essentially take your, take your clause library 
and make a template by stacking intelligent building blocks, intelligent clauses on top of each other. And then with a, a simple questionnaire, you can basically generate um, the most flexible documents that you can imagine, like um, you know, building on the NDA as an example. A typical example that we see is with one click of a button, you can basically switch between uh, a mutual or a unilateral NDA. Uh, you can even switch between like a short and a long version, a heavy and a light version. Um, you can choose optional clauses. All of that kind of stuff um, is uh, is available there. Uh, so that's that's one word. Uh, that can be addressed using clause base. Another workflow is where volume isn't so much the challenge, but rather um, the uh, bespoke nature of the document is a challenge. So you're you're creating this uh, this type of document where um, you're you're doing a lot of uh, manual uh, research, or you're doing a lot. You're doing very specific things with negotiations, for example. In that case, you'll need those those individual clauses as building blocks. And, and sometimes the confidentiality clause, for example, may, may just not really have the right nuance. And in that case, you want to be able to switch very easily, very quickly to the kind of clause that does have that, that right nuance. Uh, and that's what we make available. Um, again, building on the templates, building on the precedents of the, uh, of the clients. That's what we make available in a clause library. Uh, and that basically allows you to create legal documents simply by stacking clauses on top of each other. The system makes sure that the styling, uh, numbering, um, uh, even, even the legal content itself in terms of specific legal nuances or specific commercial nuances are uh, consistent. So that's what clause base does um, in the course of the the next 20 minutes or so that we have I'll, I'll go a little bit more into detail on on how we apply uh, AI in that kind of uh, in that kind of a tool uh, but before I move on ahead with with that sort of very technical explanation uh, what I'd like to focus on first is kind of the uh, perception of AI basically what is AI because it is something that a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on so as you can see here um, a lot of different subsets of AI exist um, machine learning being probably the most recognizable one uh, but obviously, speech recognition has come a very long way um, in, in the past couple of years. Think of uh, Alexa and, and Siri and the like. Uh, robotics, naturally, uh, with, with Boston Dynamics, uh, for example, also has, has very robust um, uh, systems there. Um, the expert systems is actually something that, that clause base identifies us. So, so I'll, I'll be going into, into more detail on that in, in just a second. And then, of course, natural language process processing the ability for um, for computer systems to basically read human text and understand what it is saying and to also reproduce it then in a way that makes sense uh, to us. That's that those are all just a couple of examples of um, what is traditionally considered uh, to be AI. What I will excuse me, what I will focus on in in this presentation because we don't have the time to go through every single one of these subsets. And also this is not not even an exhaustive overview of all the subsets. Uh, what we'll be focusing on is expert systems, which is what clause base is is mostly about, and machine learning, which is probably the most recognizable form of AI and, and typically the type of subsets that most people think of when you refer to the term AI. So let's maybe first take a look at expert systems. Uh, you can see base, basically from this diagram right here, but an expert, expert system is basically software that kind of emulates the decision-making process uh, of, a, of a human expert. Uh, and that is something that you would typically present in the form of uh, a formula of if X, then Y. Uh, so for example, as a lawyer, uh, you could say, uh, let's say that I'm, I'm drafting a license agreement. If the license is remunerated, then include a royalties clause. That's something that's that's kind of that 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 connection that a human lawyer, a human expert would make. Uh, and the idea of an expert system is to have that human expert input their knowledge into a knowledge base, and then with the application of a rules engine, a user can basically say, okay. Um, in our previous taking our previous example this license is indeed remunerated so the user basically says x 
And then the machine knows to uh, do Y as well. So if the license is remunerated X, that's something that's filled out by the um, by the non-expert user, by the by the um, user of the tool. Uh, then Y, and then the Y is of course um, executed by the software. So document automation of the type that Clausebase offers, uh, legal drafting software is is a, a very great example of that. Let's maybe go to a. Uh, specific um, uh, example here. So this is this is very basic. This is a screenshot from our own uh, document automation mode, which again basically works by having an intelligent template, or rather a template consisting of intelligent building blocks, and then an easy to fill out questionnaire on the left hand side that manipulates that um, that template. Again, on the left hand side, you fill out the X. And then this, the tool will show you what happens uh, Y on the right-hand side. Um, so here in, in the, the, uh, the question that you're looking at, um, the user is asked for a specific agreement, is the commencement date known? And in this case, by default, the answer is, is no to that question. And so in other words, the, uh, cl the clause dealing with the commencement date, the term clause says the provision shall commence on the last date of execution because we don't know what the commencement date will be. However, if we answer that question in a different way, if we say, yes, the commencement date is actually known, then the text will change and it will instead ask another question, as you can see on the left-hand side as well, it will ask another question saying, okay, what is the commencement date then? Excuse me. And that's a, a very basic um, application of that sort of if X, then Y conditional logic, uh, you, you might also want to call it. But um, it is it is um, the basis of what basically an, an expert system allows you to do uh, in clause base. That level of if X, then Y can be taken multiple, multiple, multiple levels further. Uh, specifically, the most value that you can typically add with document automation are those kinds of questions, those kinds of nuances, if you will, uh, those kinds of conditional logic, where with one click of a button, 70 changes are made to a document. Um, for example, uh, we work with a lot of lawyers who do public procurements, and depending on how your own public procurement system in your own jurisdiction is set up, those may have different um, different kinds of uh, implications. We are uh, a company based in Belgium. In Belgium, you can see that there are three main sort of um, types of public procurement. There can be um, assignments for services, assignments for uh, supply, and uh, assignments for goods. And so basically, depending on one of those three options, if you, as we have, if you automate a kind of um, tender document for, for a governmental entity uh, on those, on one of those um, uh, um, sort of different nuances. You can see that like 70 cha changes are made across the entire document. Uh, and that's where expert systems really shine. Now, expert systems do have a very good application. Some, some would even say that they're not AI as such uh, because it's, it doesn't rely on that sort of in instinctive magical feeling that that AI tends to have, or that that uh, that surrounds the term AI, um, and there's there is something to be said for that. I mean, it is very much still human oriented. The human expert is still very much in the driver's seat, and as a result, it does have its fair share of challenges. Um, you can see that there's a very narrow application domain. Typically, it's it's the kind of thing that can be. Uh, decided using you know float uh, decision trees or thing where there's a very logical progression of uh, if this happens then that happens if this happens then then that happens uh, you can also imagine that it is very time consuming to build um, for document automation obviously there are ways to um, go around that a little bit and and have to take into account that um, a document needs to be drafted sufficient sufficient amount of times in order for it to, to actually become um, necessary or, or even useful to think about automation. Um, whether where that number lies exactly is is something where um, it typically depends 
complexity of the document, the amount of languages it is in, the length, all that kind of uh, stuff. But what we found is that on average, if your document is your type of document is not being drafted more than 30 times a year, um, then it probably isn't even worth it to, to think about automating the document unless it has like very complex uh, reasoning uh, built into it. But um, that's that's kind of our, our, our basic rule of thumb. Um, and of course, uh, a final challenge, uh, it's, uh, it has to be inputted by a human, you need that human expert, um, especially in large organizations where these kinds of automations occur, and to run into issues when people leave, and uh, no expert remains behind that, that has the skill to, um, to adequately sort of uh, use this, this uh, expert system. So that's again uh, clause base in in a nutshell. Based an expert system, we made a very um, uh, clear decision. We made a very thought out decision to go with that type of of AI um, because, of course, machine learning and and all of the um, the effects that that entails. It has a lot of potential, but what we've seen is that the technology just really isn't there yet. Um, maybe to just uh, take a quick step back. So um, how do typically people typically interpret machine learning? Uh, that is simply a process kind of by, by which vast quantities of data are fed in. And then that system gets progressively better at a certain task without having a human expert. Uh, in the driver's seat without them having direct control over it or some way or without sort of direct human intervention. Um, so essentially, um, you feed uh, thousands of, of clauses to a system and thereby the system learns to make correlations in order to, to make uh, to extrapolate and to make educated guesses on uh, when it next encounters a clause of that type to say, okay, this is a clause of, of that type. Um, and that's because there are many more, many more interesting applications also, I should say, uh, outside of the legal domain. One of my favorite being the, um, the, the, uh, the one that you can see in the top left-hand corner, uh, which is uh, basically a, um, a project that was uh, a year ago or something, where uh, a stand-up comedy special was written by bots uh, who were made to watch 400,000 hours of stand-up comedy specials and then tasked to write their own um, to write their own special. Um, and it is filled with with absurd and and nonsense kind of jokes, um, which of course uh, would to are completely um, unintelligible, but which the machine just kind of yeah uh, had to learn from from flawed examples, and as a result uh, made made something uh, um, uh, kind of stand up special as well. That said, it is still very much. Um, so uh, if if you do find that uh, online, it's uh, a stand-up comedy special written by Boss. I think if you if you search for that kind of term, you'll you'll definitely come across it fairly easily. Some more practical applications. Uh, IBM created a uh, a tool that can beat humans in debating. But um, what you'll find then is that it, of course, it, each application and it's it's hard to kind of branch out to to other applications. Um, uh, sports articles are also a very good example of um, material that is available in vast, vast, vast quantities um, because, you know, there's so much surrounding sports. Uh, and so a, an AI tool was, was also fed with that kind of information and then uh, was able to churn out um, um, baseball articles, basically. Um, some other examples include uh, things like uh, AlphaGo and Deep Blue, which respectively uh, are of Go and of chess, uh, which we'll probably all be familiar with uh, to you. The Atticus project, which you can see on the right hand side, is actually a, um, a kind of uh, project where a lot of uh, preparatory work was done to basically assist a tool in uh, discovering the different kinds of nuances in commercial contracts. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, assist contract review tools um, based on, on that sort of labeled, uh, that sort of guided uh, training of a machine uh, learning system. Um, building on that, uh, you, can, you can kind of see that there are typically three approaches to machine learning. So one is supervised learning, where basically 
um, don't just feed 100,000 confidentiality clauses into the tool and hope that it is able to recognize what a confidentiality clause is at the end of it. Uh, but you you kind of label those clauses. You kind of indicate already to, for in relation to certain, uh, well, basically, clause you kind of already um, um, explain to the tool uh, what it is supposed to learn from uh, from those um, from from that material uh, this typically results in much more accurate lessons that the tool can then draw or that, that the system can then draw from all of that those vast quantities of data but naturally more time consuming to uh, to learn. Unsupervised learning is where you basically um, ram 100,000 clauses into a machine learning tool and you just kind of hope for the best. I know that's, you know, uh, that's that's a, a little bit of a, a shortcut of what it actually means, but, is, but um, I think it, it, it works as a summary. Enforcement learning works on a similar premise as, as unsupervised learning, but it, it kind of, uh, or rather supervised learning, but it takes a sort of, um, um, approach where instead of preparing the material up front, the tool is kind of rewarded for correct guesses and bad guesses, because ultimately that is what, what a lot of machine learning is, is just uh, making educated guesses based on thousands and millions of example examples. And if you take if you take the legal sector as an example there, um, you can see this clause on the left hand side is a, it's a basic dispute resolution clause. Um, if you use these kinds of uh, snippets of text into a tool, what will ultimately come out is that they'll um, start seeing these correlations, these these um, these relationships between these individual clauses, uh, but it doesn't understand necessarily how the world works. It doesn't understand what a Brussels is or what a Bel knows that that word tends to pop up in um, in dispute resolution clauses. And so, yeah, there's there's also stories where, for example, a um, a, a tool was primarily trained on on U.S. law. And uh, because such an over of the um, the clauses that were used referred to Delaware as the governing law, or rather the, the the company was incorporated in Delaware, so the governing law was was Delaware. Um, the tool assumed that if a, a clause contains the word Delaware, it is probably a dispute resolution clause. If it does not contain the word Delaware, for example, if, if New York law was, was selected, then it couldn't be a, a dispute resolution clause because it had come to believe that all only clauses that contain, or rather that dispute resolution clauses could only be, uh, can only contain the word Delaware in there somewhere. So it didn't really understand what Delaware as and, uh, and unfortunately, that kind, those kinds of, of um, uh, flaws mean that it, it is just not precise enough in most cases for, for contract drafting. It's basically impossible at this stage and, and for the foreseeable future to ask an AI tool, uh, please give me a, a balanced liability clause, which includes a liability cap of this amount and maybe like a super cap of this percentage, like that sort of very detailed real world knowledge requiring uh, query is something that an AI tool currently work with where we bump up against the limits of what um, uh, AI can do for, for contract drafting. And so, yeah, um, that's a very good example uh, also for the first bullet. So there's no AI that has really reached that stage of, of, of general intelligence. Um, uh, you can see that not everything is, is, you know, a classification problem in the sense that um, a lot of um, nuanced knowledge is, is really required. Uh, a lot of human creativity is, is still necessary in contract drafting. Um, AI, of course, also requires huge data sets. So um, for an individual law firm, for example, uh, it is impossible to train, to accurately train an AI tool uh, to, to recognize its, its own clauses and things like that, because uh, a law firm, even if it's been in business for, for, for over 100 years, will typically not have the kinds of volumes necessary to provide an accurate training. Um, and then, of course, uh, AI is also brittle. That's the, that's the Delaware example that I made just now. Uh, where uh, if if all of a sudden a, a clause is, is found that contains New York as the uh, as the governing law, then uh, the AI just doesn't know what to do with that information.
Uh, and then, of course, uh, one of the major problems, especially for uh, people like myself based in Europe, uh, based in Belgium in particular, we, we, we have three official languages. Uh, and what we find is that the kinds of volumes required to uh, accurately train uh, AI models is typically not available in our languages. Uh, specifically, in our, in our case, that's Dutch, French, and or German. So where do we use AI? And, and I realize that I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll just uh, very briefly gloss over this. Um, for, we offer a tool that supports multilingual drafting. And so what, you, what you'll find is that AI does have a very high accurate, high accuracy um, application in um, finding out how certain grammatical conjugations occur. So, for example, in French, uh, French is a gendered language, so um, adjectives and nouns and and of course pronouns and a lot of different words that in English would be sort of gender neutral, like an adjective doesn't change because um, the the subject is either male or female. Uh, that is the case in French. So in, in French, there's a lot of like um, grammatical conjugations that need to occur there, but AI can, with a very high degree of accuracy, say, okay, if this is the um, the subject of the sentence, and then this is the adjective, and then if I know that the subject is male or female, then I know exactly how to conjugate that verb in order to be grammatically correct. And um, that's that's one application. Uh, another is uh, with the help of text recognition. So in our tool, it's possible to click a clause inside of Microsoft Word and to have our tool kind of uh, perform a semantic analysis and then say, okay, um, you know, based on, of course, human supervised training, um, basically, basically say, okay, I see that the words force majeure are coming into play here. So um, if, if those words are included, then I will suggest that uh, this is a force majeure clause and provide some additional information. Um, same with, for example, as you can see here with an assignment clause, um, depending on which clause you click, the, or the appropriate um, information is shown. And then finally, uh, in order to populate our tool, uh, we offer an import mode where basically you upload all sorts of Microsoft Word documents and, and the tool will make a first pass at subdividing them into individual clauses. This is something where the tool has to make judgment calls and typically AI underperforms when it has to make these kinds of judgment calls. So we do offer our human users the ability to um, make changes to the proposed clause structure of the um, of the tool. So, so to basically correct where the tool might have gotten it wrong. Um, and what we found is that for those specific use cases, we can guarantee that kind of uh, uh, accuracy or that kind of uh, precision that you need for contract drafting. And for those elements where that accuracy cannot be guaranteed, at the very least, you still have that level of, of human overview. Um, and that's in a nutshell. Uh, what contract drafting in AI can can mean for um, for legal tech tools like like ours? Um, obviously, this was the 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 short summary. There's there's much more to uh, AI in contract drafting and AI in general. Uh, but I do hope that this was a a useful primer or a useful introduction, to say the least. This was very interesting, Sina. Thank you so much. And I do like that you took a very practical approach um, rather than saying, well, this is what the future is. This is what you all are doing now. And I think that's a huge difference in many of the AI presentations I've seen. So I really appreciated that. Uh, I am sure Justin has a question. So I'm going to allow him to ask a question. And then I will ask anyone else has questions as well. Sure. Thanks, Summer. Uh, thanks for my presentation, Sina. Um, really, really interesting. Um, the question I have is not so much about the contracting process and the input and the output, because I think you made that really clear as to how it works. So I really do appreciate that because the majority of presentations that I've been to about uh, technology and law, what is blockchain, what is you know NFTs, what is AI, whatever it is, they always talk about the future rather than the practical reality. So I, I really did appreciate that as well. Um, but my question is, so typically speaking, lawyers, have duties and with those duties come potential liability um how is that dealt with for software like yours uh, or your companies um when typically software of this kind if it's let's say outside the context of law would usually try to disclaim any sort of warranty or liability um, and pass that on to the consumer but in the context of contract drafting where typically speaking a lawyer would have some sort of duty 
Um, how is that a del how is that addressed or dealt with on the flows base? That's a very good question. Um, thank you, Justin. So um there's two kinds of approaches that can be discerned there, right? Um, in the majority of cases, lawyers will use these kinds of tools for purely internal purposes. The client will, in most cases, never even know that these tools are being used. Um, a, a contract can be drafted using a tool like clause base, and um, the lawyer ultimately does the necessary amount of review before sending it out to the client. And then, of course, it becomes hard to 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 you know state some sort of disclaimer based on that the tool was was used or the the contract rather was was used with a with an AI tool um, that's that's um, mimics basically the traditional way in which legal services are provided. It's just that you know a specific tool is being used, much like Microsoft Word is 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 a tool that is used in in that process. So we typically don't see a lot of you know, disclaimers being added there. Uh, what we are also seeing in a minority of cases, a, a second route is where lawyers are creating or law firms are creating client solutions where they're not doing one-to-one -one services with, with an individual client. Uh, they are putting out a legal product into the market. Um, for example, a, a contract generator of some kind, uh, which is not one-to-one, -one, but one-to-many. Anyone can use that that contract generator, or multiple people at least can can use that contract generator. Uh, and in that case, uh, you'll you'll typically find the traditional disclaimers, where um, lawyers will try to say, "Look, um, again, because we work with an expert system, um, that you know uh, the expert has covered a specific number of bases." Uh, when inputting their knowledge into the knowledge base, um, but we'll clarify that, look, um, we cannot possibly cover every single eventuality. Uh, and so please consider this um, to be either like a first draft piece, please contact us for, uh, for, for further information. Um, but of course, if you deal with that kind of a document, and, and I will say that that is very rare, uh, but if you deal with that kind of document where you have a, a very good indication of all the possible permutations and there's no real skeletons in the closet possible anywhere, there's no real like um, uh, real world consequences that will affect how that document needs, what that document needs to look like, then uh, in a lot of cases you, you um, you don't run into any sort of you know liability issues, but uh, law firms are correctly um, and adequately you know um, uh, concerned with not putting anything out there that uh, would potentially not be suitable for the client. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Latsana. So because of our time constraint, I will have to end it here. But I want to say thank you so much to both you, Sana, and you, Metka. I think this was a perfect combination of people, because even though you're speaking about two very different things, um, you have used your legal backgrounds to have uh, some type of tangible change in society. So, Sana, with your expertise in applying AI to contract drafting, which is... I would say very revolutionary, but also realistic in your application, which I truly appreciate because you actually showed us what is happening. And Metka, with your moves in the music industry. So I really appreciate both of you. I think it was great to see how um, anyone in the legal field can actually use their knowledge to achieve different things. And especially for me, I get a lot of students who study law and say, I don't actually want to practice law but I don't know what else to do. So I always think it's great to have people who have gone down a different route. Um, maybe you have been in practice and you've changed since then, or you know, maybe you practice and do other things. So it's good to see that you can, in fact, do other things with a legal background. And in fact, the legal background gives you a host of skills that you can apply in other contexts. So thank you very much, both of you. And I look forward to interacting with you again, hopefully in person in the future. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. Thank you.